Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's Policy Exchange webinar. And, uh, let me begin by apologising for our delayed start. We've um, been overcoming technical difficulties, so uh, we hope they are behind us. My name is Richard Eakins. I'm the head of Policy Exchange's Judicial Power Project, and I'm a professor of law and constitutional government in the University of Oxford. Well, our subject today, as, as you will know, is the relationship between human rights law and parliamentary democracy. It's a subject which is um, always of importance, but seems especially timely just now. Human rights law is seldom far from the news, as you will know, whether in the context of asylum and immigration, lawfare against UK troops, criminal justice and counter-terrorism, or more widely. As of last Friday, the Human Rights Act has been in force for 20 years. And it's clearly had a major, sometimes controversial, impact on our law and our constitution. So it should come as no surprise that the government is reportedly set to announce a formal review of the Act, and that's a review that may perhaps culminate in recommendations for amendment or maybe even repeal of the Act. Policy Exchange's Judicial Power Project has long been critical of the Human Rights Act and some of the ways in which it's been interpreted and applied uh, in UK courts. Clearly, human rights law has helped to fuel the rise of judicial power in recent years by inviting and requiring judges to answer questions that one might otherwise have thought would be political questions and requiring courts or inviting them to exercise a kind of supervisory jurisdiction over parliament and government. And while everyone agrees, or everyone certainly should agree, that human rights should be protected by law, it's much less obvious that the Human Rights Act or similar legislation is the best means to this end. Lord Reid, President of the UK Supreme Court, was this morning on BBC Radio 4 this morning, uh, or an interview by him was broadcast at least, uh, gently suggesting that it's unfair to blame judges for applying the law Parliament enacted. Now that must be right, but of course the counterpoint is that it's not unfair, uh, it's not unfair to judges to ask whether the legislation they've been asked to apply should be amended or repealed. And in asking that question, it will be important to look closely at how judges have in fact understood and applied the legislation and to ask whether they've at times misunderstood it. So in thinking about how best to protect human rights, Parliament will need to consider with some care how the Human Rights Act has worked out in practice, what its wider impact has been. And I hope Parliament will also consider the experience elsewhere in the common law world, including Canada, India and the United States on the one hand, and Australia and New Zealand on the other. And a comparative perspective may help us better understand and evaluate how our law protects human rights and better consider alternative constitutional arrangements. So with a view to enriching public discourse about human rights law in these ways, Policy Exchange is very pleased to host today's conversation between two highly distinguished lawyer parliamentarians who have both thought long and hard about human rights, human rights law, and the proper role of courts in a parliamentary democracy. Let me introduce them to you. The Honourable George Brandeis, uh, Brandis QC, forgive me, has been Australian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom since 2018, a post he took up after 18 years in the Australian Parliament, having served as Attorney General for Australia from 2013 to 2017. Across his career, he's worked extensively on questions concerning human rights and human rights law as an academic, barrister, and then parliamentarian. And notably in 2009, as Shadow Attorney General, he successfully led the argument against creation of an Australian Bill of Rights. Well, the Right Honourable Geoffrey Cox QC will be well known to you all. Very experienced barrister, appointed as Queen's Counsel in 2003, and then becoming an MP in 2005. As you will know, he served as Attorney General for England and Wales from July 2018 until earlier this year, which was something of an important an eventful period in constitutional terms in this country. And he's robustly committed to the rule of law and the rights of Parliament. Well, George and Geoffrey will speak together for about 30 minutes, after which we'll have um, a brief time for questions. So without further ado, let me invite George to open the conversation. Over to you, George. Well, thank you very much indeed, Richard. And hello, Geoffrey. Very nice to see you again. Hello, George. Um, so can I say at the outset that uh, obviously as the Australian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, uh, it's not my role uh, to participate in your own domestic debates about uh, the Human Rights Act and what ought to be done with it and whether there ought to be one, um, because that just wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, 
But uh, in a broader sense, I think it may be instructive um, for those who are decision makers in the domestic UK debate to learn about the Australian experience. Because as Richard pointed out uh, in his intro, uh, we did have that very debate in Australia about 10 or so years ago. Um, and I was one of the main protagonists in that debate as the Shadow Attorney General. I uh, led, the, um, uh, led the argument from opposition. The opposition in those days in Australia uh, took the very firm view, which I very strongly supported, that there ought not to be a Human Rights Act in Australia, that the best way to protect human rights, uh, to better protect human rights, was to strengthen the parliamentary scrutiny of legislation from a human rights point of view. And so um, the, the, the Labor government at the time, uh, held a, uh, in Australia, had a national consultation about the desirability or otherwise of a Human Rights Act. Um, the opposition, uh, uh, which, uh, as I say, I, I took the lead role on the issue for, um, participated in that debate by both critiquing the idea but also proposing an alternative model. And the alternative model was the establishment of something that hadn't hitherto existed in Australia, and that uh, is a st standing committee of the parliament that would review uh, all legislation from a human rights point of view, and in particular, uh, the consistency of bills uh, with uh, international covenants, uh, such as, obviously, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, and, and uh, other familiar international instruments as well. Also, importantly, uh, uh, it would review that legislation against common law principles too. Well, that debate raged in Australia for about a year. Uh, it was essentially in 2009. Uh, and as a result, um, the then Labor Attorney General, a man called Robert McClelland, was actually persuaded to the opposition's model. And so the, the then Labor government decided not to proceed with the enactment of an Australian Human Rights Act, but did uh, adopt our suggestion of creating a powerful new committee of the parliament, which, um, as we argued, had the virtue of both uh, augmenting protection of human rights, while at the same time locating that protection centrally in the parliament at the heart of parliamentary democracy, rather than um, effecting a massive transfer of power to unelected judges. Now, that remains the case in Australia. It remains uh, the position of the um, incumbent Conservative government in Australia. It's a position that the uh, opposition in Australia haven't shifted from, although I'm advised that recently uh, they did say that uh, uh, were they to become the government, they would re-look at the matter. But uh, that, that is the position we took. That's the position uh, I advocated. And uh, I'm not, of course, saying that that's what the United Kingdom should do. But I think the debate in Australia should be instructive. I mean, George, I, 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 I'm fascinated to, to hear particularly your own personal involvement in this. I mean, the debate in Australia as to whether there should be a Commonwealth Charter goes back some distance. I recall that in the either the 80s or the early 90s, there was a constitutional commission uh, which I had to cite in a case in the Privy Council once. Um, and certain states, of course, have uh, developed and implemented their own charters. I can't remember how many, but certainly some of them. Yes. Uh, so that to some extent, the technique of the enforcement and vindication of human rights is uh, accomplished by those means at state level. Am I right? Yes, some states have state human rights acts. That's true. Yeah. And of course... Uh, the political context of our own um, our own Human Rights Act was very, very different. And you could argue that, um, as I as I would, I think we took a wrong turning in in 1997. I think I, I would agree with you. I think what troubles me most, 
and I don't know about you, is the sometimes rather hubristic assumption that because a nation does not choose to vindicate and defend human rights by means of a judicially enforceable charter with supremacy over uh, statute law, or if not statute law, then a modified form of judicial review of statutes, which we have in England, does not thereby mean that the nation loses the right to be called a democracy. Um, and I think that there is uh, floating around in some circles the assumptions, perhaps unquestioned and unanalyzed assumptions, that there is really only one way of asserting and defending human rights, and that is by judicial enforcement um, and judicial policing of very broad principles, allowing judges to take decisions over a wide sphere of policy and moral issues. Now, Australia has, has, what you've just described, George, is that Australia stepped back from that. Um, and it would be interesting to explore, wouldn't it, why? What is it about the temperament, the judicial culture? I don't know to what extent the judiciary supported um, a, a charter of rights in Australia. Um, but of course, what we had done, it, 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 and this was an important part of the background of the Human Rights Act, is had signed up to the European Convention on Human Rights which meant that what we were getting throughout the late 80s and early 90s was a series of embarrassing Strasbourg judgments, uh, which um, made us feel or seem like a kind of recalcitrant uh, um, actor. And the argument that was deployed in the run-up to the 1997 general election, and then, of course, uh, followed with the 1998 Act, was the um, that in order to be able to avoid these embarrassing international judgments against us, we needed in some manner or another to enable our own courts to enforce it. Now, Australia didn't have that problem, did it? No. Um, you didn't, you weren't subject to a supranational court that would tell you, well, Australia here has, uh, has been delinquent. We were. Indeed, and, and of course, um, the debate you had in this country, as I read the history, um, was all tied up with broader, uh, a broader discussion about sovereignty and the extent to which uh, the sovereignty of, of the, the, the nation state of the United Kingdom uh, was compromised by membership of, of the uh, European Union. Uh, and uh, that, that m multinational dimension of the debate was not an aspect of the debate about hu a human rights charter in Australia. It was simply, uh, and, and, and undoubtedly, I'm sure, that fact alone powerfully shaped the trajectory of the, of the debate in this country, um, whereas in Australia, uh, our debate was much more, I, I dare say, a first principles debate about what parliamentary democracy and the rule of law mean and how we protect both of those concepts in an appropriate separation of powers. And that's really what I mean by context, George. The context was profoundly different yeah. to the Australian debate, which was a fairly long-running debate, and has been, and to, to that which we experienced here in the UK. As you rightly say, first, we were members of the European Union, economic communities, it was called, back in those days, um, and we were members of um, a, the, Euro the Council of Europe and the uh, uh, Strasbourg um, uh, Court. So, and of course, we had admitted the right of individual petition so that citizens could go directly to the supranational court, none of which had Australia um, to contend with. And I think I would argue one other thing about the context Human Rights Act. I think you have to look at the political culture as well as the judicial culture quite closely. Um, in the early 1990s, I remember it well, there was a, in, in Britain, there was a growing sense somehow that we were out of step because we did not have 
this judicially enforceable charter of human rights. Um, it may well be because, obviously, we were looking to Europe and, and nations that subscribed to them there. Um, and there was a considerable sense, I think, that um, a momentum building up to the 1997 general election. But you could argue that in truth, um, what happened in 1997 was a series of constitutional changes, and indeed 97 to 2005, that reflected a particular moment in British history and British culture. You had a left-wing party, the Labour Party, that had, ha that had um, now controlled by a group uh, of lawyers, um, who had eschewed um, socialism uh, in its traditional senses throughout the 1970s. Indeed, New Labour um, set up its flag by uh, rejecting many aspects of the Labour tradition uh, and sought to create a new, an idea of what it meant to be um, a social democratic or left-wing party. And of course, by shutting themselves off from the kinds of change that previous Labour parties had contemplated, nationalisation, um, by allying itself to the wealth-creating and wealth-producing drivers of the country to make themselves politically acceptable, some have argued, and I think there's a lot of force in this, that it really only left uh, the kinds of constitutional change in order for this progressive instinct, as they would characterize it, to be fulfilled. What I would contend, in other words, is that we had a moment in history where the left-wing party in British politics, having closed down other areas of transformational change, decided to focus, but not in a very coherent way, on constitutional change. And it was really the triumph of the Whig theory of history applied to the law. But somehow the expansion of the law's ambit is an unmitigated good. It is, um, it, it is a progressive force, and that to allow judges to take decisions uh, is a fundamentally progressive step. And that Whig philosophy of the law, I think to a large extent, still applies here. The, there is a lack of judicial scepticism, perhaps I should not unfairly say judicial scepticism, but scepticism throughout the legal communities in the United Kingdom about the, the extent to which judicial decisions can do good in our society. Now, you and I, I suspect, would argue as Lord Sumption did recently in his brief lectures, that we ought to be more in praise of politics, that what we desperately need are revived and rejuvenated systems by which politicians and elected polit um, uh, um, officers can make some of these really crucial decisions. Well, Geoffrey, I mean, you and I are both barristers who um, have served for a long time in Parliament and both had the honour to be the Attorney Generals of our respective countries. So I guess we've seen it from both sides. We've seen the way in which arguments are presented in courts and the way in which judicial reasoning works. And we've also seen the way in which um, uh, controversial issues are, are, are mediated and, and resolved through the parliamentary system. Um, for myself, um, and this might reflect a, a reasonably conservative uh, constitutionalism on my part, um, I am very wary about giving judges political power. Now, of course, the decisions judges make, particularly important constitutional decisions, will have profoundly important political implications. That's understood. But nevertheless, the judicial function is essentially a dispute resolution function, as you and I both know. It's not a policy-making function. 
that the policy making function and the, and the ultimate determination of the great political issues of the day in a parliamentary democracy belong in the parliament and in the executive government which the parliament throws up after every election and to which uh, and, and 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 which is answerable to the parliament of course the process yes, I, I, I mean I, I agree the process of judicial reasoning and the process of political debate are entirely different they are uh, they that they serve different functions in a democracy and in a democracy which respects the separation of powers i think that ought to be acknowledged not only as a constitutionally good thing in itself but because the process of reasoning is entirely different judges are there to resolve disputes members of parliament ministers prime ministers are not there primarily to resolve disputes they are there to set direction for a nation and to have that direction called under close scrutiny scrutiny by the parliament and in particular the opposition that is an entirely different exercise yes and i i, I would agree george and it, it, it seems to me that um that that applies not only to what you might call broadly policy matters, but there are many, many moral questions, uh, questions relating to abortion, questions relating to assisted suicide, questions of an acutely contested and contestable kind in a democracy, where there's no really powerful reason or even any principled reason why the decision should be taken by judges as opposed to the elected representatives of millions of people in their democratic assembly. Um, here in this country, um, we, we have a, a, a court um, a, a, that, that is, it has been invited by Parliament. And I have considerable sympathy with Lord Reid's uh, observations um, this morning. Um, Parliament itself has invited the judges into these regions have to some extent exposed them to the kinds of controversies that we've seen in recent years. But I think it was Professor Goldsworthy, who, who our distinguished uh, uh, moderator this morning knows, this afternoon knows well, who, who had a very memorable phrase, which is that it was difficult to see why uh, over these kinds of issues a majority among five elderly men in those days sitting uh, in the appellate committee of the House of Lords or in the old Middle States Hill, uh, sessions uh, in, across the way in Parliament Square should decide the issue rather than a majority within 650 elected um, MPs in the House of Commons. And when you think about it, that's not a, 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 um, a, an inapposite remark. Why should it be? that a court sitting of five or seven or nine or however many, by a majority, decided a highly controversial moral question as to whether or not, for example, assisted suicide should be permitted in the United Kingdom or elsewhere, um, rather than a majority of the 650 people elected by the people to do it. And I think this crystallizes a growing sense articulated both by Judicial Power Project, but by Lord Sumption uh, recently. But what one is grasping at here is what is the real legitimacy for judges taking this decision rather than parliamentarians? It's hard to discern any such principle. Um, uh, and in many ways, the messy way we politicians, George, we, we in your case, formally, politician solve problems um it is messy democratic politics it does solve things by often fairly odd compromises uh, and time tells whether or not those compromises stick but frankly the, this messy resolution of disputes which i can understand why many of our colleagues in the legal profession uh, disdain is often a more legitimate way of resolving even in the quiet forensic halls and corridors of 
Supreme Courts. Well, I, I agree with all of that. And I think there are three issues, Geoffrey, that you've identified, each of which are, sli which, which are quite different. One is the issue of legitimacy. One is the issue of competency. And one is the issue of transparency. So on the issue of legitimacy, it is surely our fundamental principle in a parliamentary democracy is that it is for the people through their elected representatives to decide society's most important, to make society's most important decisions. And the example you give is a very good example of assisted suicide. Whether um, the United Kingdom or Australia should be a nation in which uh, assisted suicide is allowed is something that somebody has to decide. So the question is, who is to be the decision maker? Is it to be the elected representatives of the people or is it to be a specialist group? Which brings me to the second part of what I took to be your observations and that is the question of competency. Why is it that we think that men and women trained as lawyers, invariably those in the higher echelons of the judiciary, extremely good lawyers, have any unique insight because they are very good lawyers into ethical or moral questions? They may, but there's no reason necessarily to believe that they do. There is no reason to believe that the ethical or moral instinct of a lawyer is any better than the ethical or moral instinct of a member of parliament and probably inferior to the ethical or moral instinct, instinct of a professor of ethics or a priest. Thirdly, there's the issue of transparency. Because as you and I both know, Geoffrey, for all its its glorious confusion, the ch a parliamentary chamber is, is a place where the public business in, is transacted in the most visible possible way. Whereas the perhaps uh, more well-mannered, uh, perhaps more quietly spoken, perhaps more erudite uh, chambers of a courtroom is not a place where the public uh, can oversee the conduct, conduct of those debates. It is inex largely inaccessible to the public. These debates about fundamental issues, of which the example you've given is as good as any, should be debates that happen in the public square, not in the privacy of a courtroom, where although theoretically the courts are public institutions, we know that the arguments that are made in court don't attract the degree of public notice and scrutiny and notoriety that um, Prime Minister's question time, for example, attracts. And this was a very powerful influence, by the way, in the debate in Australia. Um, this sense that if you relocate the venue for the resolution of these very important decisions from the, the, the halls of parliament to the courtrooms, then you really largely give them into the exclusive possession of a cast of, 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 uh, a, a cast of lawyers who are not only not representative of, and they're not meant to be representative of the people, but they, we are, let us face it, Jeffrey, you and I are both lawyers, we are a narrow, cast among the community. In the 1920s, there was, I think, a French philosopher called Julian Bender, B-E-N-D-A, and he developed the term the clerisy to describe the small group of, um, uh, of, of, of people who, in some societies, arrogate to themselves an inappropriate degree of decision-making power merely because of their expertise. That's not the way democracies work. It's not the way democracies should work. And it's not a function that the courts have either the right or the competency to discharge. 
No, George, I, I think I agree with you. I mean, the only cautionary note I think I'd say is, once again, um, I mean, having grown up within the profession here, I think most judges would strive very hard to avoid taking decisions which they thought properly were for the policy-making um, arms of the Constitution. And indeed, as you know, in judicial review principles, uh, whole, um, whole judgments have been devoted to trying to establish when a decision is not an appropriate one for the court and one that is not. But of course, the problem is the moment you install into your uh, um, into the panoply legal system, a, a, a document like the Human Rights Act, a statute, which uh, has a constitutional status, which is, you know, which Parliament invites the courts to treat very differently from other statutes that uh, imports and gives effect to the international instrument, the convention. Um, all of that leads to, uh, um, uh, uh, um, and I, I again would argue, to a judicial approach or culture that even if it's not conscious uh, in some, or indeed in many, um, is expansive, it, it cannot help but extend its reach. Uh, thousands of lawyers are devoted like, like uh, worker bees to persuading the judge to, to go a little further, to expand the a reach of a particular provision or a particular right. And we've seen that, how human rights under the convention uh, here in, in Britain and uh, imported and given effect by the, by the Act have gradually extended their reach, their ambit, uh, so that we've got to a point where the administration of a slipper to a child, while possibly not something that many of us would want to engage in, um, nevertheless um, is argued to be inhuman and degrading punishment. Um, and where, um, where all kinds of social rights, social security rights, um, became open to Strasbourg decision-making and thus um, gradually uh, by derivation here in the United Kingdom. So, I think the problem we have is that we in Britain have opted for a particular form of this type of system of uh, general rights, judicially enforceable, which has encouraged, and indeed probably inevitably so, an expansive view of judicial decision-making. What we need to see, I think, is an old-fashioned scepticism as to the limits of judicial power restored into judicial culture but that could be very difficult unless we make external changes to the statutory and constitutional framework in which the judges operate um, and that i think is what we're wrestling with here in the united kingdom now you avoided the issue you and i might say the problem um, i don't think it, it was done with mischievous intent it's interesting to reflect on what was done not far from you in New Zealand, where, where there was a different type of uh, entrenchment or non-entrenchment, but enforcement of human rights with their Bill of Rights. Um, there are different ways, I would contend, in which the very necessary and crucial cause of defending fundamental rights, none of us would disagree how important that is. We all take pride in the common law inheritance, in those great decisions which established many of our liberties, both in Britain and throughout the world. Think of Somerset versus Stuart, when Mansfield decided famously that there was no power to coerce uh, a slave. The contract may be enforceable, but you couldn't detain them because it was contrary and repugnant to the common law. This is the tradition we have inherited, and it's not necessary to that, to have an abstract charter. And I think we in the United Kingdom have to grapple now with what is the precise way, if we feel things have gone too far, where there's a certain amount of uh, judicial expansionism, and I would contend that there is, how do we restore into the culture 
uh, of the profession and of the judiciary um, a sense that it is not an unmitigated good for judges always to take the decision. I think that's present among the judiciary. The question is, how do we make the externalities assist them uh, in, uh, in taking judgments or not pursuing this progressive expansionary approach that we've seen up till now? I'd be very interested in what you would prescribe for that, George. I mean, uh, do we need... I can't invite you as a distinguished High Commissioner to make interventions in the political sphere. Um, but one option, of course, would be to see the Human Rights Act amended uh, or um, repealed and replaced with something different. My own personal feeling is that there may be a strong case for in having something like New Zealand has, a statutory Bill of Rights, but without the additional panoply muscular interpretive um, uh, techniques um, that, that are um, present in the Human Rights Act. I don't know if you have any feelings as to how we might approach it. Well, I, I do need, I think, to be a little careful in um, being prescriptive about the way in which a domestic issue gets resolved in the United Kingdom, but I've pointed, uh, I hope, instructively to the Australian experience. But can I... Um, I think what you say, Geoffrey, about the importance of culture, both the political culture and the judicial culture, is very important here. And I do think that lawyers are acculturated in, and increasingly acculturated to wishing to expand judicial power for all sorts of reasons. But the observation I would make is that ultimately... Every argument for the expansion of judicial power comes at the extent, at the expense, I should say, of the curtailment of parliamentary power. And that means at the curtailment, at the expense of the curtailment of parliamentary governance. And what it reflects, the more often you hear people talk about um, the desirability of, ex of, of expanding judicial power, what they really mean, of course, is relocating a large quotient of, of decision-making from parliament and parliamentarians to judges. What it almost always reflects is a loss of faith in the political system. And Lord Sumption, in his, his lectures last year, uh, reflected upon this. Rather than the courts st stepping in almost as avenging angels of the public good, so much better, it seems to me, that we should improve our democratic institutions, our political institutions. Now, you used the phrase um, uh, much earlier in the conversation, Geoffrey, you talked about the defense of, in defense of being in defense of politics. I think Bernard Crick, um, uh, after the Second World War, wrote uh, a famous book, of that very name, in defence of politics. I, as a former politician, you as a politician, know, feel in our bones that our democratic parliamentary system, for all its imperfections, is a good thing in itself. Representative democracy is a good thing in itself. And rather than look for ways to remove from the democratic mandate categories of decision-making and locate them in a much narrower public institution, because the courts are a much narrower public institution they, they need to be to maintain their independence and integrity, much better to reform our parliamentary institutions than to give up on politics. I think we should be proud of our political system. I, I saw it tortured in this country during the Brexit debate over the last couple of years. But you know what? Even in the most difficult circumstances, when the government couldn't assemble a majority on the floor of the Commons and uh, for, for, for long agonising uh, months uh, and more than a year indeed, couldn't go to the people because of I the, the well fixed-term Parliament Act. Nevertheless, 
your parliamentary institutions were able to achieve a resolution in the end. And uh, I, I, myself, my, if I myself, if I may be forgiven this um, observation, think that that fixed term Parliament Act was a travesty of Westminster government. And the best, uh, uh, one of the main reasons why your system was so deadlocked for so long was that the most obvious mechanism for the resolution of a deadlocked parliament, that is a general election, wasn't available to Mrs May. But my point is that people, whether they are liberals or conservatives or socialists, whatever they are, as long as they are Democrats, should put their faith in the democratic institutions to solve, to be the, the principal institutions to resolve society's disputes and leave the courts to resolve litigation, including constitutional litigation, but acknowledging that their role is much more specialist, much narrower, and will never have the democratic mandate that a parliament has. Well, George, I mean, your words fall like, uh, like honey upon my ears. I agree with every word of that, I think. And um, I, I think the, uh, what I was going to say is having been participant in those extraordinary parliamentary and political battles and exchanges over the last two years, um, it was brought home to me, and it's messy. Democratic politics is messy, as you know. There are rows, there are battles, there are fights. We hope not physical, but it's not even inconceivable. Well, well, Jeffrey, Jeffrey you, may, you may say that, although I'm reminded of a remark that the distinguished former Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, made after visiting the House of Commons once. Uh, and he was asked uh, uh, by the then Prime Minister what he thought of Prime Minister's question time. And he said very politely that... Uh, much as the debate had been robust, compared to the floor of the House of Representatives, it was like a vicarage tea party. Well, I, it doesn't surprise me, but I, I think even by Australian standards, um, recent, uh, recent battles in, over Brexit have been pretty uh, bitter and not to say vituperative. But you see, that's what I would contend, uh, that, that in fact makes the democratic process of resolving these contested, acutely controversial matters. So important. I mean, human beings can't always solve something in a kind of rational, analytical, forensic way. Sometimes they need to have a row. Um, sometimes it clears the air. Sometimes we find a solution by deadlock for months, then a breakthrough. The rhythm of the way politics solves things, as you've said, is fundamentally different. And I was it was brought home to me some months ago when I was Attorney General. I went to the valedictory a tribute to the former president of the Supreme Court and the exceptionally able and distinguished uh, Queen's Counsel, uh, who was giving that val first valedictory speech on behalf of the bar, contrasted as she put it, the way in which decisions had been reached in the Miller cases uh, before the Supreme Court, with what she said, and one could barely, um, one could barely resist the mental image of her holding her nose at the time, with what had been going on across the square, and there was a there was a disdainful tone, entirely well intentioned and intended to be in praise of the president at, uh, at that day and. Uh, but what it suggested to me was very strong, is what you have been saying, which is that there is now, among our brethren um, and our sisters also in the legal profession, a conviction, almost unquestioned, that the way in which democratic assemblies solve disputes in all their messy, raw, as you put it, transparent ways, is somehow inferior to the manner in which judges quietly go about um, resolving disputes and questions. And we have to, I agree with you, George, we have to defend politics. It's why I think Lord Sumption's valuable contribution uh, was so important. It's why I think the Judicial Power Project is also important, because we need voices. 
who say, as you rightly say, the expansion of judicial power does happen at the expense of decisions taken within and by democratic assemblies. And I do believe that at this moment in the history of the United Kingdom, of all moments, when the people of this country, given the chance to express their will and their desire through a referendum, whatever we may think about the, 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 the revisability of referendum, having expressed it, this in many ways, I believe, was an assertion that the means by which we've been doing things for many years no longer attracted their assent. And that kind of governance by which we've been governed did depend on, to coin a controversial phrase, government by experts, government by um, committees, by organisations of, of a kind not fully understood and transparent by the British people. And as Lord Bingham said um, in his great book, the, the Rule of Law, you may recall that resonant statement in which he said, the British people have not thrown off one yoke. He was then referring, I think, to the papacy. But we have not thrown off one to be replaced by another. And I think what we, it is urgent, and I support the government's initiative here in the United Kingdom, to examine and look into very carefully how we should construct the framework of law so as to assist the judges in better understanding their role as opposed to parliament. Now, I do not mean to criticise judges. This has been an invitation offered them to by parliament. And the Blair settlement in this country is overdue now, 20 years later, I think for a re-examination and possibly a reorientation. But that will not be, as I know you feel, at the expense in any way of the rule of law, of the ability of the courts to hold the judgment, the, the, the decisions of ministers and public authorities to account. <clears throat> it, will, it will need to achieve a better boundary because my fear, and I don't know if this is a one you've shared, George, or whether you have any parallel experience of it in Australia. You know, it was Hart in that great book, The Concept of, of Law, who said that the scope that judges have to redefine the fundamental principles on which our law legal system exists, and our constitution exists, depends for its acceptance by the populace, by the people, on the prestige that they have gathered by making thousands of judgments in the kinds of dispute you were talking about, um, where the law is not contestable and where the framework they apply is not contestable. And that prestige is to be very, very sparingly used, I would contend. Well, I... I it exists... It, it exists, George, that scope to make the fundamental decisions of a kind that, that are highly controversial, but it has to be very sparingly used because that prestige that Hart spoke of is not inexhaustible. It's like a bank of credit. And my worry is that the more decisions that are taken of a kind that are seemingly entering into the policy and political sphere where the people feel they have been deprived of the power because their own democratic representatives are not taking those decisions, the more it will undermine the faith in the judiciary that this country and the Commonwealth nations as a whole are wont to have in their judicial offices. Well, I agree with that. Um, I agree with it wholeheartedly. And I think you know, one of the indicia of a successful judiciary is its anonymity. Um, I dare say that other than lawyers, there would be very few people in this country who could tell you the names of all the members of the Supreme Court. In Australia, other than lawyers, there would be very few people who could tell you the names of the seven justices of the High Court, which is Australia's highest court. 
And one of the reasons for that is because there is an implicit and deeply grained public assumption in both countries that the courts, the judges, are the neutral, um neutral umpires, not the protagonists. And, I mean, I can't help but compare that virtuous state of affairs with the debate you get in the United States, for example, as we're seeing at the moment, uh, about um, the appointment of judges to their highest court, which is entire, seems to be entirely conflicted politically because the reputation and perception of the Supreme Court of the United States and the public um, expectations of its role are entirely different from and more ambitious than the expectations uh, and reputation of the courts in the United Kingdom and in Australia. And I think ours is a much healthier situation and I wouldn't wish to see it compromised. The more the, um, the courts trespass or are forced to trespass into the resolution of issues that are not truly legal issues, but ethical and political issues, the greater the hazard that um, that new perception of implicit perception of neutrality will be lost. I agree. I intervene just to say that um, you're obviously right, uh, um, George, to draw that contrast to the United States where everyone in the world knows who the, um, uh, the members of the Supreme Court are and who the contender is uh, to, uh, to form the next member. Uh, that court has enjoyed immense prestige around the world and maybe especially amongst the lawyerly classes. Maybe that's uh, about to change or maybe it's in the process of changing. But certainly courts like the United States Supreme Court, Canadian Supreme Court, European Court of Human Rights, very powerful courts have, have enjoyed immense prestige amongst lawyers, which has been a driver, I think, for uh, some of what one sees. And I wonder if, um, if does that remain the case amongst Australian lawyers, or is, is the United States viewed as a cautionary tale? Uh, does there remain a dormant sort of uh, enthusiasm amongst Australian lawyers for an end state that is a much, much stronger uh, court adjudicating human rights disputes? Well, the point... Um that I'm making, Richard, is this. Uh, nobody in the Australian system would um, uh, reflect adversely on the eminence and the judicial expertise of the members of the Supreme Court of the United States. The point I, I make, though, is that if the basis upon which appointments to that court are disputed, is a basis other than the eminence and expertise of the members. If the basis on which uh, the, that there is the, the, the principal argument is a political argument rather than a judgment on their qualifications as lawyers of eminence, then that is not as good a situation as we have in the United Kingdom or in Australia when people are appointed to the highest courts of our countries. And there isn't this contextual and really, as we see in the United States at the moment, overwhelming public debate, not about their legal eminence, but about their political opinions or their, or their presumed political opinions. We build this as an Anglo-Australian conversation, uh, and I should give Geoffrey um, uh, a word to say in a moment, but um, then I may seize the last word as, as a New Zealander living in the United Kingdom. But Geoffrey, did you want to make a last, uh, last remark? We have to bring things to a close. Uh, uh, only to say that I think, I think what unites George and I, probably, if we're honest, is a love of our parliamentary democracies, um, a profound belief in them, and a profound belief, perhaps, that over recent years they have been diminished, and that what we need to see as George so rightly says, I think, is a revival and a renaissance of parliamentary democracy um, of so often in Britain, the most talented lawyers don't go in any longer to the House of Commons. But there was a time when illustrious members of the legal profession
could be found on the green benches during the day and in the courts, or rather during the evening and in the courts during the day, are great figures whose names resonate down uh, our history. And I, I think that the words that Lord Sumption used in praise of politics is the concluding note that I would, uh, I would sound, which is that it really is time for us to defend politics as a means of making decisions. Um, and to say to people, that, as George has done in Australia, there are systems by which we can improve the monitoring and scrutiny of rights inside Parliament. Let's revive our parliamentary um, procedures and our parliamentary democracy. And what a moment of opportunity now confronts us. A moment as we leave the European Union, finally, on the, at the end of this year, when Parliament takes back control of every aspect of policymaking in this country, and has to remember that something upwards of 40% was made by the European Union and its institutions. Um, and now the British Parliament will resume full sovereignty over those areas of policy. Now is the time for us not only to concentrate upon the judicial defence of human rights, but to revive parliamentary defence and vindication of them. In that respect, George, I think the Australian model is something that we should learn a great deal from. Thank you. Well, it just falls to me then to, um, to thank Geoffrey and George for that very stimulating conversation. Uh, and I hope indeed that as, um, as there was further public and parliamentary reflection on our human rights arrangements that uh, an example of common law jurisdictions elsewhere for, for good and for ill will be, um, will be given full billing. So thank you both and um, good afternoon all. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon, Geoffrey. Good afternoon.